Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Conversations in Moral Theology, a show sponsored by New Wine, New Wineskins, an association for early career Catholic moral theologians and Catholic moral theology blog. I'm Alessandro Rovari, and today I'm joined by Abigail Favale, who is a professor at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame, and is the author of the recent book, The Genesis of Gender, a Christian Theory, published by Ignatius Press. Uh, Professor Favale, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So um, the book is an outstanding description, I think, of how the Christian tradition can help us think about gender and all the pressing contemporary issues connected to it. One of the things that makes uh, that make the book so interesting, though, is your formation and life story. Uh, you do not engage uh, these issues uh, as an outsider who, who explains a critique. Uh, instead, you are an expert who for a long time was invested in gender theory and part of the conversations that were happening in it. Accordingly, let me start with uh, an autobiographical question. Uh, what is the journey that led you to write this book? And could you describe your formation and faith journey to our listeners and how they impacted your scholarship and intellectual project? Sure. So I grew up an evangelical Christian in the Western United States. And when I went to college as an undergrad, I really, I think, be became intellectually awakened in a lot of ways. So I became a philosophy major because... I was suddenly allowed to ask questions that I had never been allowed to ask. And I found that to be very fun. <laughs> and I also, I think, became very interested in the discussions about women and gender roles and identity uh, because I wanted to better understand my own identity as a woman. Um, and also how I didn't always fit the narratives that I was given as an evangelical Christian and so I began reading feminist philosophy, feminist biblical criticism, feminist literary criticism, feminist theology, and I just loved it. Um, and then I, I, uh, I, in some ways, I'm like a generalist at heart. Like I love literature, theology, and philosophy, like that combination, plus focused on women and gender. Like that's my, my cocktail that I just love to drink all the time. Um, and so I went on in graduate school and I was kind of torn between all of these fields, really. Um, and I landed at the University of St. Andrews because they had a master's degree in gender theory and women's writing. So it combined philosophy, gender studies and literature in a, in a really unique way. And so I, I loved it there. And then I got funding for a Ph.D. So I stayed on in um, in that discipline. So it was housed in the School of English. So my PhD is in English, but um, my doctoral research was very heavily philosophical and theoretical. Um, and sorry, I just got um, I just got a delivery of one of Edith Stein's books <laughs> from a from a night from a from a blessed messenger just dropped off finite and eternal being. So that's <laughs> exciting. Anyway, um, yeah. So I uh, worked a lot with the philosophy of Luce Rigorai, who is a French feminist philosopher. And so I was really into the French feminists. Um, and so even though my work was housed in literature, it was heavily philosophical and it was also theological because what I was looking at, I was analyzing the um, like theological revision in women's writing. Um, so again, that intersection between theology, literature and gender, that's kind of um, always been what, what I really love. Um, and so for then starting a graduate school, then all of my 20s, I was really invested in the field of feminist literary criticism and feminist philosophy and gender studies um, and published in that world. My dissertation became a book that got a feminist book award. So um, that was like that was, you know, my home as an academic. And then at the end of my 20s, I had this pretty unexpected conversion to Catholicism, which was disorienting, to say the least. But it um it really upended my worldview in a lot of ways. And my interest in gender has not waned. My interests have stayed the same, but I would say the worldview that I approach these things from has 
significantly changed and is now, um, I would say, the Catholic worldview rather than what I usually describe as a kind of postmodern Christian worldview that I inhabited previously. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so as the book uh, title makes clear, uh, you think that scripture's account of creation in Genesis uh, is fundamental to understand the reality of gender. Uh, why? What should we mm. learn from it? Uh, as as uh, you know from your uh, literary studies, Genesis has always has also been used by strands of the Christian tradition uh, to posit a subjection of women to men. Some mm -hmm. authors even place particular blame on women because of the role Eve played in the fall. But despite all these uh, uh, possible readings, you still decided to highlight the essential role of the creation narrative. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, for a few reasons, I think one, I'm, I think I'm an inheritor of many of those traditions you talk about, which read the creation and the fall in such a way that posit a strict hierarchy of value and power between men and women, not just after the fall, but even before the, the fall in kind of the original order. Um, so I'm very aware of the way that that text can be and has been misread and imposed, especially upon women in harmful ways. But the reason I take it so seriously, I guess, um, in this book is that, one, I'm, I'm explicitly trying to posit what I call a Christian theory, Christian gender theory. So that to me is not just simply a statement that um, is interest in, interested in Christianity in kind of cultural or textual way, but one that takes divine revelation seriously and says, OK, well, if, if this is indeed a divinely revealed text, that I believe is deeply allegorical and has symbolic language. You know, I'm a, I am a literary person, so I'm very comfortable reading it as that. Then we need to take seriously what it says and wrestle with it and listen closely to it. I would also say, actually, um, I've often regularly taught in my career as an academic ancient literature, which is funny because that wasn't my specialty in graduate school. Um, so I've have had the opportunity to teach other cosmologies, other creation narratives. And it was actually through the process of teaching other creation narratives that I began to see Genesis in a different light. Um, I think sometimes coming from a Christian background, the text is so familiar that you, you become blind to what's unusual about it, or it's been told to you in so many ways, it's hard to actually see it. And so um, teaching the Enuma Elish, which is a Babylonian creation narrative that has the same kind of cultural origins as at least the first um, creation story in Genesis, it serves as this foil that brings out some of the really, I would say, radical and innovative and unusual marks of the Genesis creation narratives. And foremost among those, I, I would say, is the, the elevation of sexual difference. It's really unusual to see such a preoccupation with sexual difference in creation narratives. Sometimes it's not even mentioned at all. Sometimes it's mentioned in a way that maybe men are the focus and women are kind of sidelined. But in both the creation narratives in Genesis 1 and then in Genesis 2 and 3, the culmination of each narrative is not just the creation of human beings, but also the sexual differentiation of human beings. And because creation narratives, they they teach us our, who we are, like our nature, but that's always in cosmology connected to purpose. So origin is always connected to identity or nature and purpose. And so I still think that as a Christian, as a Catholic, Genesis is our, my cosmology as a Catholic. And so I believe it speaks the truth about, on, from a, on a theological level, it speaks the truth about our origins and our identity and our purpose as human beings. Um, so I spend a lot of time interpreting it as the foundation for my, my book. So obviously part of taking Revelation seriously is also about taking uh, the idea of the fall uh, seriously. Yes. And, and obviously uh, it's uh, in Revelation there is a strong sense of the before and after uh, the fall, or the rebellion, the entrance of sin uh, into the world. So, um, in what ways the creation narrative is still uh, relevant for how we interact in our world today? Uh, isn't it the case that at this point, those ideals of communion, those ideals of self-gift, mm -hmm. 
are uh, unreachable and what we are left yeah. with is conflict and violence and oppression mm. and, and, and things of that nature, which ultimately, as we will discuss more, uh, made feminism make sense. Uh, mm -hmm. the emergence of feminism makes sense. So uh, what's your position, again, when it comes to the fall and how that characterizes the way you think about these matters? Mm, that's a really good question, right? Because you have the creation narratives, but then things go wrong pretty quickly, right? So that's a question I think I still, like right now, I'm particularly wrestling with is, okay, mm -hmm. what do we do with the gap between the ideal and the real? in this life, because that's where we all are all the time, right? So we have this beautiful ideal that's portrayed for us in Genesis of, of harmony between the sexes, between God and humanity and all of creation. But of course, we also experience profound sense of disharmony, disharmony in our very being, disharmony between the sexes, disharmony in our relationship with God and the rest of creation. So, um, I mean, one thing that I think is important on, I guess, the, the sexual difference angle is how that relationship in particular is corrupted through sin. So this is, this is where I kind of stake the need for an explicitly Catholic understanding of feminism, right? Because there are plenty of Catholics who just would want to say, we don't need feminism. You know, feminism has been negative. You know, you can just be Catholic. That's all you need. Um, why, why have the need for Catholic feminism? But I think it's because the dynamics between men and women have been corrupted by the fall, that we need a specific attention to that dynamic of domination between the sexes that um, is so endemic to our world. And I think we will be wrestling with it as long as we exist in this age, right? It just comes up in different ways. It manifests in different ways. So that's what are the, that dynamic of harmony and communion is corrupted into a dynamic of domination. And I think as Catholics, we need to be attentive to the way that that plays out in society. But I think another part of Catholic theology is this belief that the redemption of Christ opens this new order. There's the original order, the fallen order, but then there's also the redemptive order. And through the grace of Christ that is active and at work in the world, we can begin to repair some of this disharmony that exists, but not through our own action, not through our own ingenuity, not through our own effort, but really by cooperating through the grace of God that's at work. Um, and it's not like this quick, easy fix, right? But at the same time, I don't, I think it's, I disagree with the perspective that would just have a feudalistic, like, well, the world is broken and fallen, and then it'll be restored one day in the next age. And for now, we just have to kind of work with what we've got. But rather, no, we can actually enter into the redemption now and begin to be healed ourselves, like our own interior disintegration as human beings can begin to be healed through God's grace. Um, and our our relationships can begin to be healed, right? So um, we can enter the redemptive order. Thank you. Um, as you enter into the details of the Genesis story and how we should interpret it. Uh, you also enter into the details of uh, feminism and its history, its, uh, uh, its, uh, its conversations. And you provide what I think is a very helpful account of the different stages or waves that characterized it. And you also clarify something that I think it's very important, how we can only talk about feminism in the plural, given how multifaceted uh, the movement and its thinkers are. In your analysis, though, uh, you do seem to suggest that there is a prevalent form of feminism uh, in the water of today's culture and mm. conversation, one uh, that tends to cast freedom for women as freedom from feebleness. So how did feminism arrive at such an affirmation and what are its consequences for women today? Mm. That's a great question. Um, well, in my, in my book, I do trace the history of feminism, feminisms, plural. Um, I think one of the reasons becomes it's difficult to talk about feminism singular is that feminist, the different feminist theories tend to be grafted on other underlying philosophical systems. So you have Marxist feminism, liberal feminism. You know, I, I say we could have a Catholic feminism, right? And that's because 
the underlying worldview and presuppositions are usually borrowed from somewhere else. So feminism as such has never really had a robust philosophical content to it. That tends to be borrowed from elsewhere. Um, where I think things went a little sideways, <laughs> I guess is one way to put it, um, would be between the first and second waves. Um, so in the second wave of feminism, and I treat Simone de Beauvoir as a foremother of the second wave, even though she wrote The Second Sex in 1949, which was really between the waves and, you know, probably a couple of decades before we see the second wave erupting, at least in the U.S. But nonetheless, she, um, she posits this idea of sex and gender, even though she never uses the word gender, being distinct. So she writes that one is not born but becomes a woman, right? So she's making a distinction between female and woman. So she takes seriously the material reality of femaleness. But then she also talks about how woman is this cultural and social construct that has been constructed as the other of the male subject. And one thing that I find interesting when I read The Second Sex is how negative she portrays femaleness. And this is because she's coming from an existentialist framework where human being, human meaning is found in transcending our facticity. And so she really sees becoming human as being able to transcend um, our mere animalities. She sees women, females as more connected and slaved to the species than men are. And so her implicit value system then is to really valorize things that are traditionally masculine and then to devalue things that are traditionally feminine. You know, so for her, a, a man's creative action in the world is seen as something morally good, whereas say a woman having a child has no moral value because she's not transcending her, her mere animality in that act. Um, so I think that implicit bias, I guess you would say, really characterizes the second wave. And it's in the second wave that feminism really becomes allied with the pro-abortion movement as well. And that's not something that was true in earlier forms of feminism. So the, the, the pro-abortion movement was really founded by men, um, but they didn't ally themselves with the feminist movement until the second wave. And I think that that adoption of a, abortion as freedom for women um, it it um, underlines or it, it underscores that that bias toward what is masculine, right? So then, what freedom looks like for women is really about them being able to transcend or escape what makes them female, especially their fertility. So rather than trying to alter society to better accommodate the reality of femaleness. Starting with the second wave, the feminist movement has in some ways scapegoated the female body by saying that it's only through disrupt women disrupting their normal physiology and their fertility um, through contraception and abortion that they can, they can become free. Could you say a little more about this idea that you have just mentioned of the need to alter society to accommodate, co accommodate uh, femaleness rather than, again, reject femaleness. This is a topic that is very prominent in uh, uh, conversations today due to the uh, recent Supreme Court decision. Um, and obviously, critics of your position uh, would, be, would be quick to point out all the many ways in which it is in fact the case that uh, uh, women are made vulnerable, are oppressed, are uniquely challenged uh, by today's world and society, societal arrangements. So could you speak a little bit more uh, mm. about those um, kind of critiques of your work? Right, mm. so um, I would agree, you know, that our society does put an undue burden on women when it comes to pregnancy and parenting and childbearing. And I would say, though, that um, one of the root forces behind that is actually the, the contraceptive movement itself, even though that seems so counterintuitive. Because what it's, what it's really done, I think, is it has altered our cultural imagination to where we now expect women to 
have the same default physiology as men. So when that technological fix doesn't work and a woman gets pregnant, even though she's not supposed to, even though that's what her body's designed to do, she's seen as somehow that's her fault and now her burden to carry, right? And so I think in some ways this, this era of contraception and abortion has really let men off the hook for bearing the responsibility of helping a, a new human being come into the world. And so I think if we were to think about how to create a society that takes not only sexual difference seriously and femaleness seriously, or maybe sexual asymmetry is a better way to put it, the fact that because of our different physiology, things hit men and women differently and childbearing is where it's is where that is centered on, right? So if we had a society that actually took that difference seriously and the responsibility that that, that difference puts on both sexes seriously, I think we would see much generous parental leave policies, especially for women. Um, I think we might see more flexibility in terms of work. Um, I think especially perhaps being able to take some time off when you have young children and, and re-entering the workforce, that's very hard in some, in some professions such as academia, for example. Um, you can really torpedo your career if you leave the tenure track and try to get back on, it's pretty much impossible. So there are so many ways in which the, the professional world is still set up for male bodies. Um, and so I don't think as a society, we've really done the work of beginning to think, what would it look like to have a society that's set up to accommodate sexual asymmetry rather than just male embodiment? And you know, if <laughs> this is where my French feminist, <laughs> my French feminist side is really coming through, right? Because that's kind of what Lucy Rigure argues, you know, that sexual difference ha remains unthought because it's implicitly male. The, the norms and the values are still implicitly male centered. Um, so, and I would say that's still a problem and that contraception and abortion are part of that problem, not the only aspect of that problem, but it's a solution that doesn't really fix the underlying bias toward men. Yeah, I think that in many ways, um, your whole proposal stands or falls on uh, whether a Christian perspective, like the one you embody, uh, can name, confront, and also respond to the vulnerability that women suffer in our society without ignoring it. Um, mm. it I think that's an often made critique against what the uh, church, is, church teaches, for example, that there is a sort of uh, ign ignoring of the actual yes. conditions uh, of women. Instead, um, you seem to want to make a case for an essentialism in a certain way that uh, that is free though from, uh, again, the history of oppression and abuse that in many ways has been mm -hmm. attached to it. Um, yes. How do right. we recover so, yeah. this essentialist view, again, that is free though from oppression? That's a really good question because um, oops, you disappeared. Are you still there? Hold on. Well, I, that's such a good question. And I love how you linked essentialism and oppression, because I think that feminist theory really since the second wave has had, um, an aversion to essentialism. You know, you're just, you're not supposed to be an essentialist. And I remember this when I would, was doing my graduate work in feminist studies, you know, because sometimes the French feminists are accused of being essentialist because they take embodiment pretty seriously. And I do too, but I always had to kind of frame it like, well, this is why I'm not actually an essentialist, you know, because it becomes this unforgivable sin. And I think that's because it's tied to a history of oppression, right? So the idea that men and women are different in innate ways has been used to um, restrict women in ways that don't give them access to education. Um, they're seen as less rational, more emotional. It leads to their you know, kind of a dehumanization really. And so I think in response, feminist theory has perhaps overcorrected by basically saying, okay, well, the way we fix this history of oppression is by saying that men and women aren't actually innately different, but that the differences are, are purely socially constructed. Now, of course, some of them are, right? So that is true. But then the question becomes, is it all a social construct, right? Or are there innate 
differences. And I think because I take embodiment seriously, I would say, yes, there are innate differences that being male and being female, those are different modalities of being human. And that doesn't mean we're opposites. That doesn't mean we're polarities. It also doesn't mean we're interchangeable. And there are some spheres of activity where the differences don't really matter. And there are other spheres of activities where the differences matter a lot. Um, and so we have to kind of be agile enough to respond to both of those things. So I think we have to resist the cartoonish, polarizing kind of essentialism. The men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Like, no, we're not aliens. We're both fully human. Um, and I, I like Edith Stein, um, the way that she talks about the different vocations or natures. She talks about human nature on three levels. So she talks about it on the human level. So when we talk about human beings, we're talking about both men and women. Both men and women are fully human. Both share in all the faculties of being human. Both are fully rational, et cetera. Then there's the level of sexual difference. And here, this difference is grounded in physiology, grounded in the body. So there are meaningful differences here where our embodiment does you know, shape our experiences in different ways that are meaningful. And then there's also the individual level. So an individual man or woman is not a caricature either. So there's a, there's a tremendous amount of variation within the sexes and some overlap between them when we talk about personalities or tastes. So we can, we can speak about general, general differences between males and females, but that's never necessarily going to tell us exactly about this particular individual, right? And so I think that um, where approaches to sexual difference or gender go wrong is in overlooking one of the levels. So I think sometimes certain Christian traditions have focused and exaggerated the middle level, that sexual difference level, to an extent where women don't seem to be fully human. And, you know, non-conforming women are seen as aberrant and dangerous, right? But then I think sometimes we've seen in feminism a complete erasure of that middle level or a reduction of that middle level to where men and women are just seen as interchangeable. And we focus either just on the human level where there's almost this neutrality, this unisex idea, or focus just on the individual level where it's just like multiplicity, where human variation and individual variation is so you know, is so pronounced that we can't even speak of generalities between the sexes or general embodied realities between the sexes. So I think it's those, those two, um, those two extremes, I think, overlook the fact that we have to keep all three of those dimensions um, in mind when we talk about this subject. Your writing background uh, comes up again and again in the in the text because you have fantastic one-liners together with the depth of analysis. Uh, a couple of them which are related to what you're saying are uh, making room for diversity in the binary without abolishing the binary, mm -hmm. or at least that's my summary of it. Maybe it's not in the text. And mm -hmm. the other one is uh, shifting, the need to shift the value of sex identity from doing to being so that mm. the possibilities of sex sex lived out might be open. Again, these are uh, super fascinating claims. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about them? They're related to what mm. you were saying, of course. Sure, so the shift from doing to being, I think because, I think when we talk about gender, it's too often about doing. It's about roles, it's about appearance, it's about behaviors. Of course, you have this whole stream in gender theory about gender as a performance from Judith Butler. So this idea that gender is not something we are, but something we do is very pronounced, I think, in gender theory. But I also think it's not it's not unique to gender theory. Um, I think in a Protestant inflected work culture as well, <laughs> there is this we are what we do, you know, so first thing you do when you go to a cocktail party, like, oh, what do you do? You know, and the, the expectation is what do you do to make money or what do you do for a living, right? It's, um, that's where we, we locate our value. And so it becomes almost this achievement. And I think that creates a enormous amount of anxiety, especially when it comes to sexual difference, because then being a woman is not just simply this reality I inhabit that's actually not under my control. It becomes something I have to curate, something I have to achieve. Femininity becomes this ideal that I have to strive for 
rather than something that is simply the expression of my embodied person. Um, and so I think shifting from doing to being is a very Catholic move because then it, it focuses on, again, my nature um, rather than my identity as something I have to create, but rather my nature as something I have to receive. And my femininity is just simply part of my being a woman in the world, being a female in the world. So it's not something I have to perform or achieve or accomplish, but it's just simply something that I am. Um, and I find that to be very freeing. I find that to be a very freeing idea, especially for people I think who don't really fit the norm, who feel like they have to, you know, kind of perform their masculinity or prove their femininity. Uh, it can be very freeing just to, to accept one's nature and embrace it. And then um, just try to live out the vocation to love in the world. The perspective you articulate is, um, um identifiably Christian. It's actually very Catholic, as, as you are mentioning. Yet, uh, I think that one of the fascinating features of the book is that what you, are, you say uh, speaks uh, to people even beyond uh, the boundaries of the Catholic Church and even beyond the boundaries of the Christian faith, I think. Um, in particular, there are so many examples of that, and many of the things you said, I think, are an example of it as well. Among many, uh, one example that, uh, that jumped out at me was the way you described the link between the contraceptive mentality, as Paul VI described it, and the exploitation of women in our current sexual culture. Uh, I find that link fascinating because it seems to be increasingly recognized even by authors, scholars, intellectuals that do not start from a theological approach to this matter. So could you unpack uh, that uh, link uh, and tell us how it can build common ground in certain ways? <clears throat> right, so I think, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but, um, and I, I realize too, when I make these claims, how radical they might sound to someone who's never heard them before. I certainly, before I was Catholic, would have thought someone saying, these things about contraception would be like kind of a nut job. Um, <laughs> I would have thought, what, you know, contraception is like the linchpin of my freedom, you know? Um, and I remember being in graduate school in this feminist seminar. I think I write about this, this in the book and it was with Lucy Riga Ray and all these other doctoral students. And one among them was a British physician and she was coming back to do a doctorate philosophy because she wanted to understand why so many of her patients who were on long-term birth control, she herself had just prescribed this to them, were nonetheless coming up pregnant. So we were trying to figure this out, you know, and she was drawing on like, this feminist theory to try to figure it out. And years later, it was only when I, when I kind of entered a different framework and began to have the freedom to question some of these assumptions about contraception that I kind of realized that, oh, well, it's, it's actually the act of taking contraception itself creates this forgetting of oneself as a fertile being. And so then you act as if you're not fertile, which means you're more likely to say, forget taking the pill that's preventing you from being fertile, right? Or ha having more risky sexual behavior, that sort of thing. And I think this, this forgetting, this kind of cultural forgetting of fertility has um, really created a social context where male sexuality is kind of unleashed and unchecked and that the the social norms and expectations that women are supposed to live up to again are based on uh, male sexuality and, and male freedom um and that i think has led to a cheapening of sex um and also kind of a degraded view of women in particular um as as sexual objects and as as commodities um, and I, I'm not making the argument that this is solely because of contraception, right? But nonetheless, I do think that that the, the revolutionary power of becoming a contraceptive society, and I think what that has done in our cultural imagination or done to our cultural imagination, um, hasn't really been examined, I think, in as much as it, as it should be, um, so, especially outside Catholic cultures, you know. Catholic yeah. circles. Um, but I am seeing, and this is kind of fun, I am seeing more and more non-theological or non-Catholic critiques of 
at least the pill, for example, and other, and other modes of contraception from feminist perspectives. Like, why is it that women are disrupting their bodies and dealing with these side effects and carrying this burden by themselves? And it's just expected. Like, it's just expected now that women will be sexually available to men also without getting pregnant, even though their bodies are designed to become pregnant. <laughs> right? Like that's kind of an impossible demand that we've placed on women. So uh, the book um, is rich and, 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 and deals with so many uh, uh, important conversations. Um, one of them is the transgender question you use all this uh, uh, work on the intellectual history of feminism, on uh, the Catholic, fr the Christian framework to think about embodiment, sex, gender. Uh, you use it to then think about also uh, the transgender question. Um, as you do that, uh, you certainly uh, describe, you show uh, the connection between gender, gender theory and the emergence of trans identities. Yet, uh, um, you also claim that the two perspectives are inadvertently at odds. Um, would you unpack the connection, but also the tension that exists between the gender theory on the one hand and the transgender mm -hmm. narrative on the other? Right. So I think, well, one of the arguments I make in the book in telling basically feminist intellectual history is that gender theory, which grew out of feminist theory, um, has led to this kind of ironic juncture where feminism is no longer able to really say with clarity what it means to be a woman, right? So I think that fe the feminist rejection of any kind of essentialism, and some, some again, some versions of essentialism should rightly be rejected. But I think the rejection of essentialism and the lack of its own kind of philosophical meat, especially any kind of metaphysical account of what it means um, to be a human being or to be a man or a woman. Um, I think that nominalism within feminism has, has kind of led to a place where um, gender and sex are seen as social constructs, right? So that's, that's really the, the revolution we see in third wave feminism through the work of Judith Butler is not simply that gender is a social construct, but actually sex itself even the fact that we think in categories of maleness and femaleness is a social construct. And so I think that that theory, kind of that Butlerian theory, cleared the deck of um, sex. And now everything is attributed to gender, which is very amorphously defined. And so the tension I see between that Butlerian gender theory where everything, even sex, anything sex related, gender related is a social construct. And I see a tension there between that and gender identity theory, which is the idea that gender is one's inner sense of self, how one feels as a man or a woman or neither or both. Because that, that theory seems to be asserting something that's very innate and that could perhaps even be pre-social. So my, my gender identity could actually be at odds with my socialization. Right. You could have a four year old, a four year old male child who has been socialized as male, but his gender identity is female. So that theory seems to be referring to something, again, that's deeply innate and that's so real and so true that it's more real than biology. Right? And so we should trust and listen to that more than biology. So I really do see gender identity theory and gender theory as one, I think, is an outgrowth of the other, but there are significant, I think, tensions between them. Um, I think um, one of the great uh, uh, assets of the book is that um, you are not interested simply in, uh, uh, in critiquing or demolishing a, a paradigm that you think it's limited, but you are really interested in helping the church craft a way forward. In, mm -hmm. in, in thinking about and, and about these issues and also living in light of what the church should think about these issues. Uh, you do that in many ways. One element that I found so uh, refreshing and, and unique in what you write is that 
you highlight how there is uh, an authenticity in the desires of uh, mm -hmm. uh, people who struggle with gender dysphoria, who, who are uh, questioning their gender identity, an authenticity there that can in fact be recognize, recognized and embraced and, mm -hmm. and valued. Um, this should not come as a surprise to anybody who is familiar with the, the church's way of relating to people, but it does come as a surprise, uh, sadly, mm -hmm. uh, that one could be, uh, could uh, construct, again, such a Catholic Christian perspective, while also, again, pointing to the authenticity that exists in people's lives. Um, would you speak mm -hmm. to that? Because, I, again, I mm -hmm. find it one of the really essential and unique contributions that you make to the con conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I think a lot of the book, I spend time showing contrast between what I call the Genesis paradigm and then the gender paradigm. But one thread that I think profoundly connects them is that thread of desire. Because when you hear, especially I think in first person accounts of gender dysphoria or being trans, the desires that are spoken, I think, are profoundly Christian desires. They are desires for belonging. They are desires for wholeness. They are desires for transformation, right? I mean, there's something so deeply Christian about that, like put on the new man, like become someone new. Um, they're desires for the body to reveal the person, right? I mean, that's a profound, those are all profoundly good desires. Those are desires toward the right things. Um, and I think, you know, I think though that those desires can't be fulfilled with Kind of technological fix i think that the gender paradigm offers um but i do think it's so important in this context and this is something that's very hard to do what i try to do in my own work is to make a distinction between the framework that is interpreting and creating a narrative that filters people's experiences and kind of names them and gives shape to them and then the experiences in the people themselves Right, because I, I do think we need to be able to theologically and philosophically look at a framework and decide if it's true or not, decide if it gives a true account of the human person and human flourishing. But at the same time, we also have to develop real strategies for accompanying people and creating communities with people who are who understand themselves through that framework, right? So I think too often in this topic, you know, again, you have these two extremes, right? You have the extreme of just, I would say unthinking affirmation where just everything is accepted. So any, and, and uncritically, I guess I would say uncritical affirmation where anything anyone says about themselves is taken as sort of absolutely true on face value without an attention to some of the philosophical concepts at work. And then on the other hand, just flat out rejection of persons. Like, oh, I don't agree with this theological idea or I have a different understanding of anthropology than this person does. So I can't have communion with this person. I can't have community with this person. And I think we have to resist both of those choices and, and to seek accompaniment, you know? And I think this is something that Pope Francis, it's a theme in his papacy and I, it's something I've been like thinking more and more about even since I, after I wrote the book, um, about what that could look like and how to do that well, um, as a church, as an individual, um, because I think that's really where, where the most need is, I think is in that level of accompaniment. I'm going to ask a, a question that is a, a bit personal. And if you don't want to answer, please tell me no. Um, how do you personally resist this pool? Uh, again, these topics are uh, so fraught, so uh, oftentimes waged in, in ideological matters. Uh, again, they they're really become topics for the culture wars, uh, as we all know. Um, instead, the charitable position you advocate is so extraneous in many ways to this pool. And yet I'm sure that it's a struggle uh, in, in, in the kind of toxic conversation around these matters to maintain that centering. So I wonder... Uh, how do you do it or try to do it? Mm -hmm. 
I would say try to do it because I think I have done it imperfectly, right? You know, I'm sure there are times when I, and even now, you know, there are aspects of the book that I would write a little bit differently if I were writing it now. Um, I think my, just for one example, I think my view on when to use someone's pronouns, I think is, is different now than when I wrote the book because I've been thinking so much more about this level of accompaniment. Um, so I guess one, one of the things that I, I do to try to avoid it, one is to be vigilant. So to always be aware, I mean, I kind of think of that, like the siren song, you know, like the, from the Odyssey, you know, and, and Odysseus, like as the men, like everyone stops their ears and he like ties himself to the mass and you know, all these things. So I think there's always like a siren song on both sides, you know, of, um, you know, if you to, to kind of jump into the culture war on one side or the other. And so I, one thing I, I think about is having an attention and a vigilance to not be pulled to one side or the other. Um, I also, I try to limit my time on social media because I've, I've been reading about the theories of Rene Girard recently and his idea of mimetic desire and how much I think social media preys upon that aspect of our humanity. And so I notice, for example, that if I'm, you know, if I'm on Twitter and I'm following a bunch of, say, like gender critical feminists, then I'll begin to kind of adopt that tone or their argumentation too much where I'm like, oh, wait a second. I, I don't just want to be this like gender critical feminist. Like that's not actually what I'm trying to do. I am trying to kind of, you know, walk in this little way um, or on the other side, you know, kind of sometimes following too much the, the kind of total kind of affirmate, uncritical affirmation path. And then, so I think I'm trying, I try to be much more attentive to that mimetic tendency, even in myself and to, to pay attention to what I'm listening to. Um, and I also pray a lot about this. I really do. I have been an ideologue in my past and becoming one again is something that I'm, I, I, I don't ever want that to happen again. And so I pray a lot about like, show me where I'm wrong, you know, show me, sh you know, deepen my understanding, like, um, and I, I try to engage with charitable perspectives that are different than mine, because I do think this issue is so complex and there are still things that I'm learning and adjusting in the way that I, especially on that, that kind of pastoral level, um, which I think is, is so much more delicate and difficult. Thank you. Um, as uh, everybody who listens can tell, uh, you, you, you join in a beautiful way expertise and 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 really personal investment and and uh, and uh, and yeah personal investment in in these matters um which i think this book uh, is a great resource um just a personal note i use it in the classroom and yeah. uh, i've been uh, i'm a theologian so i teach moral theology and and related topics and i've always um been on the lookout for uh, resources that articulate what one could term as the traditional Catholic position, uh, but mm -hmm. do that in a in an attentive uh, way that does not simply gloss over uh, the problems, the challenges, uh, the history of these debates. So I really cannot recommend uh, the book enough. Um, this was an absolute thank pleasure. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today to discuss your book, The Genesis of Gender. And thank you everyone for tuning in. I will see you again in two weeks for another episode in the Conversations with Moral Theology. Thank you again for coming to us. Thank you.